All right, well, Kim told me to wait till we got to magic number 48, I think, but I think I might go ahead and start because this review, I think, is going to be fairly long. And I'll just let people, uh, but hey, we're at 47 anyway. So we didn't really have a lot of questions this workshop, not near as many as I thought, which I don't know if that's good. I guess that's good. Maybe I didn't make it hard enough. I don't know. But in any case, I'm just going to go ahead and jump into the very first question unless somebody had a question about the very first part. I think that importing the uh, shapefile and doing the uh, cell adjust probably should have gone okay since we didn't have any questions on that. So the very first question was, what is the situation at the downstream end of the structure? Does the upper levy connect to the middle levy? And as you can see over here, it does not. So here is the upper levy after we brought it in. And if I zoom in, you can see that it doesn't connect. There was even a hint to turn on Google Hybrid. So as most of you probably know, uh, Google Satellite is definitely your friend when you're trying to develop your models and do RAS stuff. So this question was basically just to get you to uh, think about importing your data and looking at it. So I realize you're not familiar with this model. If you're doing your own model back at your office or at your home these days, you'd know more about it. But a lot of this is just, trying to get you to think about it. don't bring in data blindly and don't just add these break lines and these shape files without thinking about it. So in this example, there's actually a reason the levees didn't connect. But in general, if you had a gap in your levee, you'd be like, well, why do I have a gap in the levee? Well, in this case, there's a gap in the levee because there's a raised interstate and it made sense. But in general, you want to investigate, you know, what's going on with your levees. These shape files that you download, particularly the levees from the National Levy Database, sometimes have gaps that are wrong. When Gary imported these, downloaded these levies, or these national levy database lines, I was in his office when he did this years ago. There were only three levies, an upper, a middle, and a lower levy. They came in, I don't know, as seven different line segments. We didn't call them shape files back then, at least Gary and I didn't. They had gaps and there were places that they were just wrong. We had to do a lot of massaging. So this particular one was okay, but there was places where they were wrong that we had to do some work. And I think it also asked, is there a particular problem with this gap? In this particular case, there was not. If I turn this back off, and if I go to my results, and I turn my maximum depth on, for my maximum water surface, the levee was not overtopped, and the water didn't go through this gap. Now, it could have been that water might have incorrectly gone through this gap because of these two levees. And the question asks you, well, what would you have done if that had been the case? Probably the simplest, you could have like tried to make the two levees match up, but probably the simplest thing now with our new terrain modification tools is if the high ground where the interstate is wasn't appropriately captured, you could have just with the terrain tools, could have added some extra high, get, high ground to connect the two levees to keep water from going through here. But as it was, it wasn't really an issue. And again, this question is just to make you say, okay, when I bring this data in, I need to, you know, examine what's going on and, you know, look at it, not just bring it in blindly. So that was the point of that question. Okay, so the next one was to uh, bring in, say, the profile line and turn on the tick mark. This profile line, the tick marks aren't getting saved. I've requested that they save it. I think we'll probably get that in there before the uh, release. So when you know the maximum water surface around the 3,500 location, I don't know, around 571.2 or so, that should have been pretty easy to say. And then I wanted to know the approximate levy height at this location and the amount of freeboard. So we don't currently have a very good, well, actually, we don't have any sort of standalone plot for the hydraulic structure, the SA2D connection that shows a profile plot of this structure and the water surfaces along the structure, like the headwater and the tailwater of this structure and profile. Gary tells me that that's planned, that we're working on it, and he even hopes to get it in release. We'll see about that. So it doesn't currently exist. So this is kind of tricky to figure out what's going along here. So we can figure out that there's a water surface here of 571.2. It's a little hard to figure out what's the uh, freeboard, the amount of a how much there is space you have on this levee before it's over top based on this water surface. Now we could like try to figure out 
like what's the elevation of this face is. For instance, I could try to plot this face. You know, I could just um, click, and one of these, I don't know if you remember which one it is. There's a, uh, out of all these different, um, out of all these different choices. This right here is the elevation of the face, but this face may not actually be at the very highest point of the terrain, if, depending on how the things were drawn. So the other thing I could do is I could plot a cut line. So I could click on my terrain. I could do this little measuring tool. I could draw a line this way. And I could plot the terrain profile. So this is like the terrain profile. I can see this is the highest point on the terrain. I can take my wire surface minus this elevation. But the issue is, and this is kind of the point of the question, this terrain does not include the levee. As they pointed out before, the levee is not automatically added to my terrain. That is the whole point of adding the terrain later to the terrain, adding the levee to the terrain to the modification tools. So to actually figure out how high the levee is at this point, I need to go back to my station elevation data. So if I go back to my geometry editor, if I go to my upper levee, I go to my weir information. Actually, I could just zoom in. But at some point, I could come in here and I could figure out uh, my elevation here is like 573.28 or something. Make make sure to make your little windows a little bigger, Steve. Okay, yeah. I keep forgetting to do that. I realize they're hard to see. I can see them easily. If you don't have your levy added to the terrain, it's deceptive to try to figure out what your freeboard is and what's going on right where your levy is. So that's kind of the idea behind the question along that, that point. So the next question is, what's the maximum velocity along the toe of the levy in this location? Um, and this one, kind of, a couple of different issues going on with it. If I come back along here, I turn on the velocity, turn the velocity max. Um, it's a couple of different things to be concerned about. One is, it's for starters, it's a little bit arbitrary what you call the uh, Change to the selector tool in the toolbar. Is that what I'm missing? Yeah. One is, is a little bit arbitrary what you call the toe of the uh, levy. If I'm getting velocities around 11 or 12. Another issue is these cells are pretty big. So it's doing, if I really want to get good velocities, I shouldn't only have two cells in the channel. And I shouldn't be using the fusion wave. We're running the diffusion wave just to make things run faster. But if you really were concerned about velocities in the channel, you should really have a lot more cells, you know, probably like five to ten. And I should really be really should be running full momentum instead of diffusion instead of diffusion wave. So this is just kind of to play around a little bit with velocities. But I wouldn't really put a lot of faith in this eleven or twelve feet per second velocity, given that this, we're going to get a fusion wave instead of full momentum. And I kind of jumped ahead, but said, what changes should be made to the model to improve the accuracy along the toe of the levee? If I zoom out a little bit, this came up in a, one of the earlier lectures that I sat in. There's a huge amount of constriction going into this channel. If we were to run this with full momentum instead of diffusion wave, our water surfaces would have been quite a bit higher with the full momentum instead of diffusion wave. And this is one of the things I kind of struggle with when I do these models for workshops. Do we want to have models that are perfect so when people take them back and look at them later, they can see, okay, this is how you make a good RAS model. Everything's perfect. This is how you should do things, and everything's good. On the other hand, do we want to have models where there's issues? And it's like, these are the sorts of things you're going to encounter and these are the things you sort of have to look out for so we could have done a lot of cells we could have done full momentum we could have shown you the correct way to do things 
ultimately we could show you the problems and these are the sort of things you kind of need to look out for. The other issue is if we would have done this with full momentum and if we would have done things like let's say with 10 cells across here, we would have gotten more accurate results and things would have looked better and would have been a better way to do things. If we would have done 10 cells with full momentum, we could not have gotten away with a 20 second time step. We probably would have had to done, I don't know, maybe a one second time step. And our runs instead of being a minute or two, you know, might've been 10 or 15 minutes, which would have made the workshop not been able to do as many runs. And since we really don't care about the accuracy, it's like, well, let's just do the fusion run. But we end up with models that don't really look great. And it's like, okay, this isn't really the best way to do models when you're back. So it's kind of a trade off. But in any case, those are the biggest changes I would have made to improve the uh, accuracy or the velocity. Okay, so the next question was, is when does the breach occur? There's a couple of different ways you could figure that out. Um, well, the first thing was is to add the uh, levy breach and run it again. Um, there's gonna be a bigger workshop on doing a dam breach. So I don't really wanna focus on the breach parameters and all the information, but hopefully nobody had a problem actually entering the breach information. There's a couple of ways to figure out when the actual breach occurred. One thing is you could just kind of animate this until you figured it out. So this right here, you can see when this breach happens, this is accurate to about the nearest five minutes. Alternately, you could go to the, and it's accurate to five minutes because that's all the more, I'm only outputting a five minute output right here. Alternately, I'm doing my hydrographs at one minute. So I could do my hydrograph plot. This is kind of hard to read, so I'm not gonna zoom in. But based on my hydrograph plot, I could figure it out to one minute. And then finally, it's not real obvious, but if you look at your runtime messages, and again, I realize you're probably not gonna be able to see this on my screen, but actually right here in one of your runtime messages, it tells you that the breach happened January 4th at 10 hours, 54 minutes and 20 seconds right here on the screen. So there's a little output message telling you exactly when it happened. Okay, so I want to ask you what the uh, maximum velocity is on the tow side. Again, this suffers the same issues of uh, diffusion wave and huge cells, but I will turn that on. So again, depending on what you're calling the toe or the levee, it's a little bit arbitrary. You can get all the way up to like nine feet a second down to six or seven feet a second. Again, if we wanted more accurate velocities, we should do full momentum with smaller cells, but you know, approximately seven feet a second or so, which I would guess is probably might be believable. So there's just kind of a general question about the benefits of incorporating the elevation data directly into the terrain. So there are some various trade-offs on it. Um, one thing is, is on the levee breach, actually even before you had the levee breach, if you have the levee actually in the terrain tools, when you plot the 2D structure, it's kind of deceptive that, you know, a lot of times it's nice to have the actual structure in the uh, model. And that's another thing too, is you can have the geometry, most of you probably realize this, but you can have the geometry on either end of the geometry or the results. If I'm entering data, I sometimes like to have the geometry on up here, but once I'm actually running results, I tend to turn off the geometries under the geometry editor and just do it in the results. So that way, if I switch back and forth between my results, I usually want to have a geometry associated with my results. So this way, when I turn results on, whatever results I'm looking at, I get the geometry for that particular result just to make sure. This levy right here that we first did, the structure is not in the terrain. So you see there's this big gap right here. And that's because, let me have, maybe I want to move this forward a little bit farther. All this right here, it looks like it's all submerged. And once again, that's because our levy is not actually in the terrain. So it looks like all of this is submerged and it's not really, again, it's just because our levy did not get added to the terrain. But once we actually add it to the terrain, which I've done in this one right here, and again, the structure kind of hides what's going on. And the other thing that's kind of confusing too, 
is the geometry up here does not include the terrain. So you need to switch terrains down here. So here's my terrain without the levee, and here's my terrain with it. Now I can see that my levee breach, now that I have the terrain in here, I no longer have the depths over here. You know, I can still see that my structure's here, and it's no longer plotting as if there's no levee here. There actually is a levee here. So in this sense, I think it's a better representation of what's going on because I have the stru structure actually in the terrain. Now, the downside of this is, is once again, um, the issue is, is my breach is not in the terrain. So it's kind of a good news, bad news. The levee is now in my terrain, but the breach itself does not get out of the terrain. We don't get the best of both worlds. You know, in a perfect world, I would have the levee added to the terrain, and then as things went along, the breach would get added to the terrain on the fly. And as I animated my bar, I would see the levee appear. Or I'd see the breach, you know, appear in my terrain as things went along. I asked Mark about this. He's like, "Oh yeah, let's do that someday." I'm like, "I don't know, Mark." At the very least, it'd be nice is if as I, if as as I animated things on my slider bar, I would like to be able to see, you know, like maybe some hash marks or something right where the breach happened. I think that'd be easier than adding to terrain. There are some ways where you can see where things are happening. Like for instance, if I turn on my uh, velocity arrows, you know, you can kind of see like my breach is probably like right, right here. That's one way I could see what's going on. There are some other options. If I come into uh, my layer properties, there is this hydraulic conductivity plot that Alex Kennedy showed the other day. Now this hydraulic conductivity plot, it's based on the terrain. So it doesn't show the breach location, unfortunately, but there's another one, perpendicular face velocities. I can turn it on. Oh, that's a little too complicated. I've got something else going on. Well, let me zoom in. So if I zoom in, my perpendicular breach velocity shows me I've got velocities across these faces right here. So that's another way of showing, showing you that these are the faces that the breach has happened across. So these are some tools to kind of show you what's going on. And again, when we have the uh, SA2D connection um, plot that Gary told me that Anton's working on, I think we'll have some better tools to show you what's going on. So these are kind of some tools to show you what's going on with the uh, breach plot or breach location. Okay, so the next question is asking, how does the run with the train modification compare to the run without, and what's the most likely cause of the difference? There really was some significant difference just at the very beginning. If I zoom out a little bit and maybe recenter things a little bit, how am I doing on time? I guess I'm doing okay. So here's my levee breach without the terrain modification. Here's my one with. So if I turn both those depths on, yeah, so this is the one without the uh, terrain modification. And this bigger one is the one with the terrain modification. So it's what the difference is, is this levee is right up against this channel. So when I added the uh, levee, it really made a big difference on how it sucked into the channel. So actually, if I plot that, I meant to actually plot that. I think that was one of the questions I probably skipped over. So this is my levee that I added with the train modification tools. And this levee right here, sticks into this channel and makes this channel even narrower. So if this is what this levee is actually doing. I've constructed the channel, and I've raised the water in this one with the levee breach. The one with the terrain modification is causing the water to be a little bit higher and it's causing the levee to breach sooner. And if that's really what's going on, then I think it's more accurate. On the other hand, if the levee does not stick into the channel, then I've incorrectly raised the water surface. And I've made the results worse. So again, this is one of those scenarios where you really need to investigate the model. You shouldn't automatically assume that this shape file that came from the National Levy database is exactly on the center line of the levy and just add it blindly. It would be the sort of thing that you'd want to investigate more closely and really know, does this levy stick into the channel or not? Now, on the other hand, the original levy that we added, we added this levy, the station elevation data as a vertical wall. Well, this, obviously this levy doesn't exist as a vertical wall with no thickness right at this location. That levy obviously has to have some width. 
So the question is, is does the width exist over on this side, on the protected area side, or does it exist on the channel side? So that would be something you'd want to, if you're really going to do this model correctly, you know, for a study, you'd want to know where does that levy exist to do it correctly, because it makes a difference on how this thing breaches. So that'd be an important question to know. Okay, and then the final two questions, I, I'm guessing most of you probably didn't get to this because this is a pretty long workshop. But the next question was, was to add the 2D domain equation, which, oops, didn't want to do that. I just covered up all my browser programs. So the final one was to add the uh, 2D domain, if any of you managed to get to it. And you had to save a new geometry to do that and click on this normal 2D domain. But the reason I wanted to point that one out is if you run it with a 2D domain, you can get velocities here of 20, 22 feet a second. And I talked about that during the video lecture, that this is using the normal 2D equation. And for a levy breach, when it first starts happening, these 2D equation can get answers that I think are just too high. I think the 2D equation is breaking down in this scenario. You know, if it was a concrete channel, you know, maybe it could get velocities that high, but I don't think those answers are accurate, unfortunately. And then, again, I didn't really expect people to be able to get this far into the uh, workshop. Doing a comparison of how quickly it made it to the residential area, a little bit arbitrary what you call a residential area, but I arbitrarily picked out, like, I think the very first house it gets to is like right about here. But comparing this 2D domain equation to the rear equation, even though this doesn't strike me as a huge distance, the 2D domain equation, using the breach as a 2D domain equation, it gets to this spot right here about 45 minutes sooner using the 2D domain equation than it did using the rear equation. So the 2D domain, 2D domain equation puts in a lot more flow, a lot more quickly than the rear equation. So it makes a big difference. So that's something to be aware of uh, running these models. And then the very last one, I ran uh, a model using a five second equation instead of the 20 second equation, and that didn't actually make uh, much difference at all.